Now, tonight, I am glad to welcome one of the world's most renowned political scientists, Professor Ronald Engelhard. He is the Lowenstein Professor of Political Science at the University of Michigan. He is author of over 300 pages which have 100,000 citations. I, I won't tell you my citation number, but you know, I'm not young, but at least I'm middle-aged. I have some time in front of me. He holds honorary doctorates from Uppsala University, from the Free University, and from the University of Lunenburg in northern Germany. He helped found the Eurobarometer Surveys, which is absolutely fundamental to anyone doing research on European politics, public opinion, and he's founding president of the World Values Survey Association, which has surveyed representative national samples of the public's in 105 countries representing fully 90% of the world's population. He's a fellow with the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and of the American Academy of Political and Social Science. In 2011, he won the Johann Skite Prize in Political Science, which is the closest thing we have, frankly, to a Nobel Prize. But Professor Engelhardt is, frankly, much more than this. In the 1970s, he hypothesized that there had been a fundamental paradigmatic shift in individual values. The basic argument, extremely crudely summarized, was that the decades of unparalleled prosperity from 1945 to 1973 were slowly shifting people's main concerns from economic scarcity, jobs and income above all, to quality of life issues, self-actualization, free expression, ethnic and sexual identity, and so on. There were, in short, fewer materialist voters and citizens and more post-materialist ones. This shift reflected a broader progressive trend in attitudes. People were more open to immigrants, more tolerant, even celebratory of homosexuality, and supportive of cultural difference over assimilation. Both the shift and the trend line upwards, at least until recently, were confirmed through subsequent research by Professor Engelhardt, by an army of his students, and by many others. Post-materialism was that great rarity, a true scientific discovery, a great intellectual leap forward. The entire study of public opinion across Western and non-Western, democratic and non-democratic societies is simply unimaginable without the research of Professor Ron Engelhardt. I would go one step further. The study of political science is unimaginable without Professor Ron Engelhardt. Now, if there's no better scholar to give tonight's talk, there is no better time to give it. To give it. For we live, frankly, in a world in which the old certainties are crumbling around us. Populism is sweeping across the globe to quote Timothy Garden Ash, like the Spanish flu. Campaigns based on lies and bigotry deliver Donald Trump to the White House and crash the UK out of the European Union. And openly, brazenly racist, far-right political parties have made gains, sometimes modest, sometimes substantial, in Austria, Italy, France, Sweden, and Germany. Against this depressing backdrop, the title of today's talk is both poignant and apt. The Silent Revolution in Reverse, The Rise of Trump and Authoritarian Populist Parties. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Ron Engelhardt. I'm not sure I'll be able to live up to this introduction, Randall. You uh, grossly exaggerated, but I accept every word. And uh, thank you so much. I'm honored to be here to become a Monk Fellow, which is uh, an honor I am undeserving of, but I accept that too. And uh, I am grateful to the Monk School and the Environics Institute. And it's a pleasure to visit Toronto. It's a lovely city, which I notice 
over time, is becoming more of a foreign city. And the first time I visited Canada, it didn't seem to be as different from the United States as it is today. You were using miles and Fahrenheit temperatures and uh, things like that, and now you're, you're pretending to be a foreign country, but I know <laughs> underlying it all, we're really pretty close, actually. When I, my dear friend Neil Nevitt, uh, I have known for a long time and uh, worked together with him in the World Value Survey. And uh, when I want to insult him, I say, Neil, you're just like an American. And he smiles. He smiles because he's a Canadian. And uh, today I'd like to talk about some work that I've been working on since really a long time, since the 1970s before any of you were born. But uh, maybe a few of you. But uh, basically, The Silent Revolution was a, my very first book, and it talked about this change in basic values. And this, uh, you've heard about it uh, just in this introduction from Professor Hansen, and I'd like to go a little more into exactly what this is. I see it as being driven by a very fundamental change. Throughout most of human history, survival has been uncertain. We have been, at times, an endangered species. The human race was down to a few thousand at one point, so we're all descended from pretty narrow range of people. There is much more genetic diversity in chimpanzees than in the human race. We're fairly, we, there was a narrow pipeline where we made it, we survived, and then we flourished. But for most of our history, survival has been precarious because of a basic ecological principle. This is true of bacteria and deer and anything that lives, you can name it. The population tends to rise to meet the available food supply. And that is held constant by starvation, disease, violence, predators. This has been true of the human beings for most, by far most of our evolutionary history. And it has left a sort of strategy which when we're under, when in danger, humans tend to have this tribal reflex, I call it the authoritarian reflex, where they band together solidarity, strong in-group solidarity, conform to your group norms, don't stand out, be loyal, be part of the tribe, hostile to the outsiders who are dangerous, because the reality is, in the hunting and gathering stage, if there's enough terrain to support your tribe, and another tribe comes along, it might literally be us or them, literally. Under those conditions, xenophobia is realistic. Fortunately, we have gone past that stage. That's in the past. Starvation is no longer a problem in advanced countries. Obesity is a much bigger problem than starvation. But we have a heritage of this. The authoritarian reflex is possible and it tends to kick in when we feel threatened. The silent revolution from literally my boyhood, I was a young chap in those days when I did my first survey in 1970, and I hypothesized that the economic miracles of the post-war era had led to remarkable changes. The economic miracles made the pie bigger than ever before, but also we had the post-war welfare states where no one starved to death anymore. In the United, even in the US, which is then the richest country in the world, in the Great Depression, people were starving. And that has pretty much been dispelled. In addition, we've had peace, the longest peace on recorded history, uh, since uh, records have been available. Already by 1984, there had been no war between major powers for the longest period in recorded history since the Greeks, since way back when we began to have records. That was in 1984. A lot of time has gone by then. We have by far the longest period of the long peace. These three things, the economic miracles, the welfare state, and the long peace brought about remarkable conditions. We were literally unprecedented. A large share of the population of Western Europe, North America, Australia, eventually Japan, grew up under conditions where they took survival for granted. That is a remarkable 
circumstance. This was, except for the kings and the nobility and a tiny, tiny minority, that was untrue ever before in history. A large share of the population and a growing share grew up taking survival for granted, and this changed everything. Let's say it changed a lot. The reason is survival is such a basic goal of any organism that as long as it is insecure, people focus their top attention on getting enough to eat on economic and physical security. These are the dominant priorities of the culture and of the individuals. The post-war era brought some fun fundamental changes that were really shocking. Actually, they didn't take place right away. It took about 25 years before this surfaced into reality because people's goals don't change overnight. They tend to change the, the, the basic personality constructs you have when you're a pre-adult. By the time you're an adult, they don't change very much. There are rare exceptions, but by and large, basic cultural change occurs as one generation replaces another so that the economic miracles and welfare states and peace from 1946 on didn't surface until about 20, 25 years later when the post-war generation, this first post-war generation, became old enough to have a political impact. Five-year-olds don't really shake up the system much. Ten-year-olds don't either, but 18, 20-year-olds do and did. You probably remember the era of student protest starting about the late 60s and in the 70s. When we had a cultural revolution, I remember hearing, don't trust anyone over 30. Today, that sounds strange, meaningless. Why would anyone say it? But at that point, it seemed to the post-war generation to be real because they had fundamentally different values from all the older groups. They had been shaped under fundamentally different conditions, and we had this cultural revolution, which I called the silent revolution in my early book. And uh, things changed a lot. There was the rise of at the time, the peace movement was the most prominent thing, but there was an environmentalist movement. Rise of this movement also emphasized strongly gender equality, greater tolerance of outgroups, foreigners, gays and lesbians, handicapped people. It was a very broad and radical cultural change, and it produced a reaction. The young people felt, don't trust anyone over 30. I never heard the slogan, don't trust anyone under 30, but it was kind of this reaction among the less secure strata of the population already from the start. There was a reaction against the environmentalist, pro-gay, gender equality, peace, etc. movement. And it was doing things that were alarming, didn't seem normal, seemed threatening to especially the older, less secure strata of the population. And from the start, there were reactionary parties in Germany. There was a Republicaner movement. Uh, in France, National Front emerged. Uh, the surfacing of this in the, uh, was visible in the US in 1972 when Richard Nixon ran against George McGovern. And this was pretty much the peaceniks were for McGovern. The materialists were for Nixon who reflect, represented law and order, prosperity, or let's say, give top priority to economic growth, not environmental protection. A whole set of things, and there was a significant materialist, post-materialist polarization. These are the terms I used for the materialists were people who emphasized economic and physical security above all, which was basically had been the priorities for a long time. And, uh, the post-materialists were people who emphasized self-expression, free choice, and this whole range of cultural innovations that today are pretty much entrenched. We have same-sex marriage in major countries of North America and Western Europe, and this was a really big change. This is one of many really big changes that occurred. We are now, sorry to say, in an era of reaction. And why that is, is a very interesting problem. We're not in the Great Depression. 
people are not starving. But we have an era, which I'll go into, linked with the nature of the knowledge economy. The knowledge economy is different. And we are moving into increasingly artificial intelligence society, which is profoundly different. And in many ways, I love it. The magic of I can get on my computer or cell phone and learn anything in the world instantly. Uh, I can, there are wonderful things that can be done, advances in medical care, potential dispelling of poverty. Uh, the knowledge society is great. The World Values Survey, one of my dearest projects ever, would be impossible or extremely difficult if we were writing letters and putting postage stamps on and sending them. And uh, at the very beginning, I did this. And two weeks later, I'd get a response, if they were prompt, from Shanghai or Beijing. And I'd have forgotten, oh, what did I say? Oh, yeah. And then I'd write a response. And a couple weeks later, they'd get it. And uh, it was tough coordinating things. The World Values Survey is coordinated on a daily basis instantly. I'm in touch with people in far off Canada like Neil or in uh, even farther off Australia or Singapore or Brazil. And uh, j just today, I've been in touch with people in Brazil and in Russia and it's nothing, it's a standard thing. This is part of the miracles of the Knowledge Society. I hate to admit it, but it is clear there's a dark side to the Knowledge Society, an unanticipated dark side which is the Knowledge Society is inherently a winner-takes-all economy. This is something which initially was not evident. It seemed like kids in, the, in dad's garage would put together some new thing and they'd become billionaires before they were 40. That's Bill Gates. More recently, Mark Zuckerberg became a billionaire before he was 30 with Facebook. Wonderful, we love it. If you're Bill Gates or Mark Zuckerberg. But there is a takeover. Microsoft took over the whole market. Well, actually, because of Apple being clever and aesthetic and so on, Steve Jobs is a clever fellow, he survived with a very good niche. But basically, it's Microsoft and Apple. And in Facebook, it's Facebook. And in Amazon, it's Amazon Iberalis. Amazon rules the world, or let's say it's on its way. In 19... Sorry, <laughs> 2017. Steve, uh, Jeff Bezos became the world's richest man due to the appreciation of Amazon stock. He became as rich as Warren Buffett and Bill Gates combined. And then in 2018, he got much richer. He, uh, one of the things that is a staggering fact is, in the first half of 2018, Jeff Bezos made as much money every nine seconds as his median employee made in a year. To say this is inequality is true, but it's inequality. Wow. Unbelievable inequality. This is the latest manifestation. It's a trend that's been going on for a while. In 1970, the chief executive officers of the top 350 corporations in America made 20 times as much as their median, as their median employee. The U.S. Was, had greater inequality than most countries. China was down to about four to one, but this was an extreme. Let's say 20 to one was the American figure, and we were relatively out in the non-equal end already. By 2015, the ratio was 370 to one. And then we came up in 2018 with this God knows what, Every nine seconds, as much as you make in a year, it's staggering. This is the nature of the knowledge society because with industrial society, you compete on price. It costs quite a bit to make an automobile or a pot-bellied stove. We were at the pot-bellied place for sandwiches today. Uh, and uh, the, 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 the cost of making material objects is substantial. And there's niches for very cheap, less cheap, moderate price, 
sort of Hopper and so on up to the, up to the Ferrari, which costs an incredible amount. And the cost of, of distributing is similarly pretty great. With Microsoft, once you've made one copy, it may be worth billions, but once you've made one copy, it costs maybe three cents to make additional copies and distribute them on the internet almost for free. In other words, there's no reason to buy anything but the Ferrari. The top product tends to take the entire market. It is not that Jeff Bezos is more greedy or nasty than previous capitalists. I would say my reading is he's actually, in some ways, a nice guy. He has saved the Washington Post, for example. He is working on improving medical care, rationalizing medical care. I would say it is not that he is greedier and nastier than previous capitalists. I'd say he's working in a knowledge economy where the sky is the limit. The level of inequality is phenomenal. And this is undermining the economic security of first the working class, then initially the top half, the college educated part of the population of advanced countries was doing well, the knowledge economy was booming and they were doing well, but first it was the bottom half, then the 60% and 70%, 80% were approaching the point where only the top 10% is making real gains. There's been stagnant income levels even for the college educated in recent decades. Surprisingly enough, they're doing way better than the unskilled worker who is a commodity with all, almost with very little hope. There are jobs, you can still get jobs, but they're not high paid, well, uh, they're not secure well paid jobs. Their jobs as security guards or waiters or raking leaves or things where there's a big demand actually for the service, but they're for the service of the top people in Silicon Valley. The structure of that economy is very, very unequal. You have part of the population making fabulous incomes and a very large, this is kind of not mentioned, but a very large people serving them as waiters, nannies, hairdressers, etc., with insecure, not very well-paid jobs, and the cost of living is such they have to commute from way outside Silicon Valley. This is a side of what's happening that is deeply concerning. I must admit it was fun talking about the silent revolution. In the 70s and 80s, things were, from my perspective, getting lots better. Growing security, Greater freedom of choice, uh, less conformism, gender equality, tolerance of gays and foreigners. It looked, hey, things are going well. And I almost blushed. I, I didn't want to seem like a Pollyanna, but my reading of the situation was, things are getting better. My reading of the situation today is, things are not getting better. We have Donald Trump. This almost is saying a lot. He is, in my view, the worst president we've ever had. We've had other people who were bigoted, dishonest, corrupt, incompetent. But this one is mega bigoted and dangerously out of touch with reality. This is really scary. You don't know from one month to the next whether the head of North Korea is little rocket man who won't be around long, or he's a really honest fellow, we can trust him, he's my pal, you know. Okay, I'm glad we didn't nuke North Korea, but from one day to the next, you don't know. Uh, I'm afraid someday he might insult the Prime Minister of Canada if we don't watch out. <laughs> uh, our oldest ally, of course, is unthinkable, but you never know. Uh, this is, okay. I've given you the overview of the theory. I've got some nice slides, so now I'll get moving through them. And basically, talked about 40 years ago, I was talking about the silent revolution. During the past three decades, a growing share of the publics of high income countries has experienced declining real income, declining job security in context with a large flow of immigrants. These things reinforce each other. 
And this has fueled support for xenophobic populist authority and movements. Brexit, the National Front, the Alternative for Germany, the Swedish People's Party, the True Finns, etc. It's a depressing list that goes on, and Donald Trump. And this is linked closely with my boyhood pal, materialist post-materialist values. Way back before any of you were born in the 70s, I came up with what I thought was as an assistant professor, really neat idea about materialist versus post-materialist values and a scale to measure them. And this was long ago. To a surprising degree, it works today. The reason is, sadly, not the surge of post-materialists is producing a reaction. It is and has produced a reaction, but the recent events in the United States were an almost perfect storm. I don't think there's any reason why materialists would necessarily vote for the Republicans or post-materialists for the Democrats unless the candidates took positions coinciding with the materialist versus post-materialist priorities. In 2012, we had a remarkable breakthrough, 2028 really. An African-American won the nomination for the presidency of the United States, and he got elected. And this polarized tremendously. He was seen as, I remember my kids being very enthusiastic, too young to vote, but working for poll watching for this election, being thrilled when Obama won in 28. It was uh, a major cultural shift. Being African American was something unthinkable. I mean, literally, you would have been laughed at in 1950 if you'd said that an African American would be elected president of the United States. This was just a sure and we'll, we'll be uh, selling automobiles to people on the moon. It, just not, not gonna happen. In 2008, Obama won the presidency and this polarized this long-standing, generationally linked polarization between materialists and post-materialists. Romney was not a right-wing extremist, but Obama was a really big change. And materialists were twice as likely to vote for Romney as for Obama. And post-materialists, this is on a 12-point scale where zero is you make nothing but materialist choices on this survey. Point five is you make nothing but post-materialist choices on this survey. And obviously the intermediate positions are one, two, three, four uh, materialist, post-materialist choices. Post-materialists were almost nine times as likely to vote for Obama as for Romney in 2012. Don't have data from 28, 2008, unfortunately, but we do and in the last two elections. And 2016 was a perfect storm. This was a time when we had, on one hand, Donald Trump, a bigoted, racist, sexist, authoritarian environment, he claims environmental uh, global warming is a hoax. Go down the list, it's hard to find a post-materialist goal that he doesn't reject. Clinton, on the other hand, was pretty liberal on the agenda and the first woman to win a major party nomination for the presidency. And this was about as polarized as you can get. I would say most unusual previous elections didn't have anything like this extreme polarization between materialist and post-materialist goals. But in this election, we had materialists almost four times as likely to vote for Trump as Clinton, post-materialists almost over 14 times as likely to vote for Clinton as Trump. This is, I've been doing survey research for, since you were born, uh, and uh, I hardly ever see, I mean, I've never come across a polarization this extreme where one long established measure of basic values predicts so strongly the polarization between how people voted for the president. Very unusual, and I would say this is most untypical, it's highly unusual that you get a perfect storm like this where you have an absolute caricature of everything that post-materialists don't want running for president and 
somebody fairly close, not perfect, but fairly close to what post do want, opposing him. So this was a tremendous polarization on this long-standing value cleavage. And this value cleavage has taken over the market. I've, done, I've been doing regression analyses, uh, what other things are important, and basically nothing. Income, occupation, social class, the things that used to be the big predictors. When I was a graduate student I, uh, at the University of Chicago, I remember studying diligently for my prelim exams, and one of the questions I was sure they were going to ask was, what is the basis of the left and the right in politics? And I came up with the right answer. Nationalization of industry, government regulation, redistribution of income. That's what the left and right are about. I passed my prelim very nicely. This is the right answer. Today it's not. Today it is much more about cultural backlash, this cultural cleavage, to the point where income, social class, if you, if you use materialist, post-materialist values, which are correlated with social class to some degree, the post-materialists are much younger, much better educated, and as all journalists have noted, the vote for Clinton was, well, let's say the vote for Trump was older, less educated, younger, better educated people strongly voted for Clinton. The demographics like social class and even education disappear pretty much if you control for education. They are strong predictors because they're closely correlated with these basic values. This is the dominant predictor in this most recent election. I would be amazed if it continues, well, if Trump continues to run, could be, but, <clears throat> and he will, I'm sure, try to run. I think he will not get reelected, but uh, this is, I wish I could promise. <laughs> Can't. I think for various reasons he probably won't, but I didn't think he'd get elected in 2016. So I can't promise, and of course, he did not win the popular vote. He was almost three million votes behind Clinton in the popular vote, but we have this incredible, archaic 18th century electoral college where the popular vote doesn't decide who wins the president. You have this weird system like the Broughton bureaus that Britain abolished in 1832 where a land area gets a seat even if there's no one living there. We have a situation rather like this where geography is represented. Ultimately, the choice is based on geographic rather than population basis, which I think is a terrible system, which, of course, the Republican Party has a huge interest in keeping. So will it be abolished in the near future? Uh, probably not. The basis of the... Uh, Okay, <clears throat> there's been a lot of discussion, in fact, book after book written, trying to explain the Trump vote. This was such a shocker to almost everyone that loads of people have been studying it. And the journalistic account was that it is economic decline, and they found that declining counties were much more likely to vote for Trump, economically declining counties were much more likely to vote for Trump than for Clinton, and that uh, basically at the aggregate level, economically backward counties were voting, or states even, were voting for Trump rather than for Clinton, which made it seem okay, this is what decides the individual level decision. It's actually more complicated than this in uh, very soon after the election, Pippa Norris and I came up with a picture, a paper pointing out that doing survey analysis, it was not the case. Income was an almost insignificant predictor, as I said. Social class, economic concerns, economic distress, all of these things that you might think would be the predictors at the individual level were not predicting. Who voted for Trump versus Clinton? It was overwhelmingly xenophobia, cultural backlash, rejection of same-sex marriage, cultural issues totally dominated the picture. Okay, this seems like a huge paradox, but there are two questions. One is what motivates people, 
in high-income countries because this is not happening. This is not happening in the whole world. Uh, this is a phenomenon of high-income countries. There is an illusion that it's happening all over the world. Actually, it's not. There are authoritarian movements in other parts of the world, for example, in China. But it's a completely different phenomenon. China is experiencing a crackdown on dissent in a time when economic security is rising, when there's rising prosperity, and where people are beginning to move on this silent revolutionary tra trajectory, and where the top-down process is. Xi Jinping is repressing the kind of things that began moving up from the bottom during the 1970s in the US. He is in firm control of China and the secret police and the, uh, the system, and he is, for the time being, repressing this. But it is not the bottom-up movement that we see in the US and Western Europe, where the less secure strata are pushing against the elites, pushing in a xenophobic, authoritarian fashion, wanting strong leaders who will protect them from these dangerous hordes of Mexicans who, as Trump has so adeptly pointed out, are all rapists and criminals. And uh, strange to say, the ones I know are very nice people. I must be meeting a skewed sample. It's, uh, this is a problem that is, that is dire, and it is dire in high-income countries. It's, uh, OK, that's a, a basic sort of side trip. But this is mainly a phenomenon linked with the tremendous rising inequality of the knowledge society. Though we find authoritarianism and nasty stuff all over the world, it has different causes. The topic for today is, uh, OK, the topic for today is this materialist, post-materialist polarization linked with levels of economic security. And this has been around for a long time. Ever since the 70s, we found this new politics dimension coming up where this classic left-right economic-based polarization that I aced my prelim in the University of Chicago with has been complicated by a new dimension cutting across it. On one hand, at the top of this chart, we find the new politics dimension with the issues being environmental protection, gender equality, rights for gays and immigrants that I never mentioned as a grad student because it wasn't that prominent. In fact, my professors were thinking about it and neither was I. And this was against at the, the green parties and the post-materialists were at the high end of this vertical dimension and the materialists defending traditional social values, anti-immigration were at the other end. And this is not new. Already, in 1983, the first Green Party broke through in West Germany, the pushing this whole environmental, peacenik, gender equality, gays, immigrants' rights uh, agenda. This was the Greens of Germany, and they were a countercultural party. And immediately, a counterparty, the Republikaner, a sort of neo-fascist party emerged, which was defending traditional social values and repressing uh, and pointing out the dangers of immigration. And in that era, they were seen as a kind of neo-fascist party and very big stigma in Germany. This was, Germany had learned a lesson. And this was something that the German people, unlike many other peoples, but the Germans had learned not good. And uh, they did not make, get enough votes to pass the 5% threshold to win parliamentary representation, but they did have a big impact anyway. They had enough push to scare the major parties into moving to co-opt their electorate. So that in 1993, Germany abolished a clause in the West German Constitution guaranteeing the free right of asylum, linked obviously with World War II and Asylum would have been life-saving for many people. And this was abolished with a two-thirds vote of the West German parliament. Already, 
1993, there was a reaction, but it was much smaller then. It has become much bigger now, not because people have become nastier. I think uh, the, I have never measured nastiness, but uh, uh, let's say I have measured materialism. And uh, I would say declining existential security explains why support for these movements is greater now than it was 30 years ago. So we have a kind of complicated picture. This has confused journalists and some of my colleagues because it is complicated. I would say at the individual level, the individual choice to vote for Trump or Clinton or the National Front or Macron or the alternative for Germany or the Christian Democrats or Social Democrats, that's overwhelmingly, I would say without a doubt, the empirical evidence is overwhelmingly decided by the cultural issues, this backlash or support, depending on how you feel about immigrants, xenophobia, uh, re rejection of same-sex marriage, rejection of the environmentalists, et cetera, this whole same long-standing generational cleavage. But my colleagues who emphasize the impact of economic factors were not wrong. This is changing everyone in a period effects because what happens is period effects by definition affect everyone in a ge given geographic unit at a given time. So you don't see it in any cross section. You only see it in a long time series. And if you do cohort analysis following given cohorts over a long period of time, you can see period effects, but you don't see them in one in any one survey. And this is getting a bit technical, but you kind of have to get a bit technical to see because the reality is complicated. The immediate cause of the Trump vote is cultural backlash, but cultural backlash has been exacerbated by the fact that for the past 30 years, secure jobs have been disappearing. Initially, the working class became superfluous, less and less secure, fewer benefits, real income declining for a large share of the, a growing share of the American population. This was real and it had an effect on everyone. Period effects tend to affect everyone so that more or less everyone, rich, poor, old, young, was going down, becoming less materialist, less post-materialist. And uh, period effects can work this way. This is, uh, uh, I'm very proud to say this is something that has been carried out from 1970 before any of you were born to the 21st century. We've got a wonderful database. Uh, getting this database is marvelous and I love it. You get 40 years older in collecting it. That's the drawback. And, uh, but we now have a dandy time series database where we measure materialists and post-materialists over almost 40 years. And we find Originally, I claimed this was an intergenerational change. The alternative, which many of my colleagues push, no, life cycle. These silly young people in 1970, these silly young post-materialists are overwhelming post-materialists, but when they are 60 years old, they'll be just as materialist as the 60-year-olds. It takes 40 years to answer this question, but we have. It is clear from the evidence that given birth cohorts did not get more materialist as they age. In fact, surprisingly, they became a little bit less. I think the, the prevailing norms changed so that any given birth cohort was pretty much the same at the end, maybe a tiny bit more post-materialist at the end of 40 years than at the start. This meant because the given cohorts didn't change, the population as a whole did change as younger birth cohorts replaced older birth cohorts in the population. The oldest cohorts have disappeared. They've been replaced by several younger birth cohorts born in uh, 1966, 1976, 1986 to 1995 and so on. And the population as a whole has changed a lot. In 1970, materialists in, this is from, pooling data from six West European countries to get a big reliable sample. And 300,000 interviews were carried out to do this. Uh, it's 
um, a lot of data. And we find that in the long haul, in 1970, materialists outnumbered post-materialists to by four to one. By 1990 or so, they were almost equally numerous. And by 2000, equally numerous. Very big change in the population as a whole, which explains a lot of changes. Growing gender equality, we got a woman who got a major party nomination in the US finally and actually won the popular vote. Didn't get the presidency, but won the popular vote rather handsomely. Things like that have changed, same-sex marriage and the law of the land, a lot of really big changes that would have been unthinkable in 1970 have happened. Cultural change and a big reaction to it. What is happening is, this is one part of it. There's been a big generational change Big cultural change based on intergenerational population replacement, but it has been slowing down because of growing economic insecurity, because basically this point about knowledge societies increasingly have winner-takes-all economies. The middle class is being hollowed out. There are still plenty of jobs for raking leaves or as a security guard, or you can work in the Amazon warehouse for 28,000 a year, which is what Jeff Bezos makes every nine seconds. And the, there are jobs still, but they're not secure or well paid, and people are feeling insecure. And this is, this is it took decades. But the American public and the publics of other countries are feeling this. They are aware they have been going nowhere for 30 years or so. What we have is, this is a simplified version of my magnificent 40-year cohort analysis in which it makes the basic point that we've had two mega period effects. Uh, we've got lots of ups and downs, as you can see, short-term period effects, which is what normally, the kind of period effects you normally find. In this case, we have two mega period effects. One from 1970 to about 1990, during which period there was a steep increase in the ratio of post-materialist to materialist. This vertical axis is simply percentage of post-materialist minus the percentage of materialist. It is negative, it is deeply negative uh, in the early years. Uh, current levels are about the zero level, meaning about as many materialists and post-materialists. In the first period, we had a steep increase. This index of post-materialist minus materialist rose by 25 points. In the second half, it only rose by five points, despite population replacement. In other words, we have had a negative period effect linked with increasing inequality, diminishing job security, hollowing out of the economy, that I think is not just a short-term fluke. I think it is inherent in the knowledge society. The knowledge society is wonderful. It may cure cancer and uh, do all kinds. In fact, it's done wonderful things. Uh, you want a heart valve replacement. They can do it with a, with a uh, they, they used to have it cut your chest open. Now they can do it with uh, a catheter that goes up you know, from your leg into your heart and they can replace the heart valve. Miraculous, wow, way better than having your chest ripped open, but, or cut open very carefully, obviously, but uh, <laughs> the doctors are not brutes. But basically, the technology is wonderful. I am no, I am enthusiastic about the potential of the knowledge society, and I have to tell you, very concerned about the potential downside of the knowledge society. It is inherently winner takes all. And of course, it doesn't take, it hasn't changed overnight. Initially, the working class became superfluous, but it's creeping up into the middle class more and more. There's been flat incomes even for the college educated in recent decades in terms of real income. They're way better off than the rest of the population, but they're not gaining any longer. What's happening is artificial intelligence is now replacing not just unskilled jobs,
but doctors, lawyers, journalists, and horrors, college professors. This, is, this gets really bad. And uh, what's happening is it used to be that uh, law offices would have loads of young, freshly admitted lawyers doing the process of discovery, reading thousands of pages of documents, beginning to nail down the basic facts of the case. Now, artificial intelligence programs can do this faster and more accurately. And they do it 24 hours a day. And they make fewer mistakes than the young, than the young lawyers, which has resulted in about 30% of lawyers now are doing jobs that don't require a law degree. If you're a graduate of the top law school, you're okay. The lower ranked law schools are turning out people without jobs to a large extent. This is a serious problem. The medical profession is being taken over. The, uh, let's say, this incipient early on. This is a good, health, health is a good field to go into basically because aging populations together with medical technology increasing means a larger share of GNP goes into healthcare. But even this is being taken over incrementally, it's at the early stages. Initially, uh, when you had an x-ray done, they would zap it to Bangalore and an Indian doctor, an Indian radiologist would read it, do a diagnosis and zap back the diagnosis to Ann Arbor, the University of Michigan Hospital or wherever you were. That was then. Now, increasingly, there are artificial intelligence systems that can read the diagnosis and do it more accurately than a radiologist with God knows how many years of training. It's, you know, undergraduate pre-med and four years of medical school then a residency and then years of residency as a radiologist, tremendous amount of training and, sorry to say, a computer program can do it more accurately, they've had, they've done tests running paired comparisons of two doctors, a doctor and the computer and so on. The computer by this test is already more accurate than the human doctor. This is a serious problem. This is something that gives me great concern. Basically, uh, let's say, Basically, there is a side to the knowledge society which initially I just loved and which now I think we have to address. Before leaving you in despair and suicidal, uh, <laughs> I'd like to say things can be solved. This is not something that is hopeless. Left to market forces, this will happen. The incentive left to market forces alone is tremendously. If I were the head of a big corporation and I were able to automate my entire workforce and replace it with computers and have no strikes, no wage bill, no problems, would I do it? Well, I'm saintly so I wouldn't, but normally, normal people would. And uh, you know, who knows what I might do if I were in that position. I would say the temptation is giant. The uh, left to market forces, this will happen. But of course, actually, we've been through this in a sense. During the Great Depression, the US and other countries went through huge problems of unemployment and poverty and so on, and developed programs. We developed welfare states and job creation programs, Civilian Conservation Corps, all kinds of programs in the New Deal that created jobs for humans. I think we're as smart as we were in the 1930s. We don't, we're not yet aware of the problem. The political system is not aware of this problem. But I would say, quite obviously, we're capable of creating jobs because in the 30s, we were desperately poor. We are not desperately poor. We have a flourishing economy. The problem is it's all going to the top. We can reallocate. I am not claiming. I am not a Bolshevik. My first vote ever was for Dwight Eisenhower. Uh, 
I was raised in a sort of normal middle class setting, but in my old age, I have moved to the left of Bernie Sanders simply because I am convinced we have serious problems that probably can only be alleviated by government. I don't see any other player stepping in, but government has stepped in to reallocate. We have lots of resources. We could be putting these resources to work, creating jobs that require a human touch in environmental protection, childcare, uh, preschool, in uh, research and development, ultimately in the arts and humanities. I think if the people in this room took a weekend to think it over, we would come up with 30 promising programs that would help, that would create jobs that need humans and put them to work doing something quite useful. Some of these programs would work, some of them wouldn't work. It would require experimentation, trial and error, careful thought. I don't say there's a simple, I would be a charlatan to claim I've got the solution. But the general principle that we can create jobs that reallocate, I think is fairly simple and fairly clear. I think it can be done. It's a question of, we now are in a situation where increasingly politics is no longer a conflict between the middle class and the working class. As Joseph Stiglitz puts it, it's between the 99% and the 1%. I have nothing against Bill Gates or Warren Buffett. Actually, they are pretty decent people who argue they should be taxed more heavily, who are planning to leave their fortunes to a huge charitable foundation. Bill Gates is working to wipe out malaria in Africa. He is much smaller scale, supporting the World Value Survey. Obviously, he's a good guy. This is not that I see these as evil people. I don't think blood in the, should run in the gutters. What I do think is, if we went back to tax rates comparable to those of the Eisenhower era, this is not Lenin, this is Dwight Eisenhower. If we went back to tax rates comparable to those, 75% maximum instead of the 35% maximum that we have now, we'd have funds to do a whole lot of reallocation. I think this is feasible, it requires the rise of a kind of consciousness on the part of the 99%. I don't think there is a class consciousness on the part of the 99% yet. This is something that has to take place. I think because the logic is so strong, people as maybe Abraham Lincoln, uh, one version is Abraham Lincoln, I'll go with him, you can fool all the people some of the time, some of the people all the time, but you can't fool all the people all the time. Democracy is a gamble that, in the long haul, the public will catch on, will recognize what is needed, and take measures accordingly. So I do not give up hope. I think that uh, there's a very big problem. I would be silly to say this is a simple thing, but I think we need radical change, not because I want to execute the people at the top. I don't think they're evil. I think it is in the nature of the knowledge society, which in a sense is worse. It is a structural problem that we have to cope with. And I think, I hope everyone here will be part of that solution. Thanks for your attention. I found it here. I was sitting on it. Okay. Um, so thank you. That was a wonderful, as I expected, um, wide-ranging, insightful, and with a clear policies prescription. Now, cue cards are going around. If you have questions, please uh, jot them down. We'll, we'll collect them and then uh, present them to Professor Engelhardt. Uh, let me start, though, with two, and I'm going to do the annoying political scientist, play the annoying political scientist trick. Ah, I thought of a couple of cases that aren't explained by the theory. And particularly the emphasis on 
uh, economic inequality as the explanation of what we'll loosely call populism mm -hmm. or an increase in materialism. And that is um, Germany, where not only is the economy going gangbusters, but real income is rising. And in a more complicated way, the province of Ontario, where we've had absolutely no austerity under the Liberal government. Mm -hmm. In fact, it was spending money like gangbusters. And we've just elected uh, a populist who's not overtly racist, because you can't be in this province if you want to be elected, but has all the other characteristics, simple solutions for complex problems, demonization of the elite, a He's provoked a constitutional crisis by trying to have the number of councillors in Toronto. So what about those counterexamples? And then what a lot of people emphasize, which you didn't mention in your talk, is not the long-term increase in inequality, which is indisputable, but rather two factors. One, in America, the election of a black president, which led a significant portion of the country to flip out, to go completely mm -hmm. berserk. And then we get the Tea Party and the extreme, even greater extremism within the Republican Party. And then the uh, uh, second one is the crash, which is obviously economic, but not so much inequality, but this massive e ex economic shock of 2008. So we start with those, then we'll collect the questions. Well, I'm glad you asked me an easy question. <laughs> uh, actually, it's a very complex question. I would say all along I have argued not that it's just economic inequality from the start, though GNP per capita is a pretty good indicator of security or, any, or insecurity. From the start I've argued that it is economic and physical security, the sense of taking survival for granted, and Explicitly, I have also mentioned xenophobia as the proximate cause, the strongest predictor of the populist vote is not economic perceptions, but xenophobia. In the case of Germany, the economy is doing well, but they have had massive immigration triggering this authoritarian reflex where this is something I was actually coming to in the presentation and then decided, well, one hour is all they can take. I'll jump, I'll, I'll end now. Basically, people take the world that they grow up in for granted. Whatever world you were born into seems normal. It's your baseline for what's normal and natural. This is the way God meant it. You were born into it. In recent decades, we have had growing cultural change, rapid cultural change in Germany, the US, Canada. And this means that older people have a much greater gap between the world they were born into and the world they experience today. This is true even for this cutting edge post-war generation, the student protesters in the 60s today. They were born into a world in which same-sex marriages, I'd say literally unthinkable, no one was thinking about it. Did you? No, nobody even heard of it. Where Af an African-American president was, yeah, of course not. Where Hispanic people were a tiny share of the US population and the US was by far the richest economy in the world. We're not living in that world today. Today, we have had an African-American president elected and re-elected, and as you say, that flipped out a large share of the population. This trigger this big polarization between materialists and post-materialists. It got even bigger with Trump, but it was already really big. Did Obama get to go down smoothly? Absolutely not. People were reluctant to be openly racist. Trump has made it okay. Uh, by now, if the president is racist, hey, we can be too. And this is one of the things that, one of the many alarming things. But we have more Spanish-speaking people in the U.S. than Spain has today. We no longer have the world's biggest economy. China has passed us up. It's not that world, and even this generation finds a big gap between the world they took for normal and the world they live in, so that even they are relatively prone to Trump. 
This is a, you know, sad to say, but uh, the age gradient is very big. It's a generational cleavage in which, of course, the pre-war cohorts overwhelmingly for Trump, but even this post-war cohort to a considerable extent. So this is, it is not just economics. It's a complicated mix where economics has made people more insecure. I would say that job security, even in Germany, jobs are becoming less secure because of automation. Uh, the, 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 no one's starving in Germany, but this massive influx of immigrants means that when you walk down the street in towns I know well, it doesn't look the way it used to look. You see people wearing hijab, you see signs in Turkish or various other languages in given areas of the town. It's not the Germany these people grew up in. Dismissing this as just bigotry, I think is too simple. These people are feeling genuine anxiety and insecurity. It's a real problem. I would say ideally, we should have limitless immigration. I think my experience with immigrants has been great. Uh, I even married one. But uh, is this something that a society can handle limitlessly? I think empirically we're discovering that there is a threshold at which even Swedes, Norwegians, Danes, and Dutch, who historically have been extremely tolerant toward immigration, all of these countries now have substantial xenophobic parties. I think it's a matter of how fast the change can come. And this is contextual. It's not as simple, I wish I could give you 15% as the threshold or 20% as the threshold. It's not that simple because it depends on the starting point. In New York, where you're born into a very diverse setting, it's no big deal to see diversity. In Montana, where there was none, and now there's a Cambodian community, it's different, and it's a jolt. I think the distance between where you're, what you're born into and what you experience is something we have to take into account, and I think dismissing it as uh, these are just bigots, okay, they're bigots, but this is a real problem. This finding that you're as, uh, you're a stranger in your own land, as one recent book put it. It's a genuine stress psychologically. So I'd say in Germany, the problem is much more related to a massive influx of immigrants into a society that did not have a lot of diversity. Sweden used to be 98% Swedish. They were Lutheran, Swedes, and blonde, and all that. And today they have 18% of the population are foreign born. And you have, alas, a Swedish xenophobic party of some size. Ontario is a tricky question. I suspect you know more about it than I do. So I'm hesitant to argue on this one, but OK. Um, I suspect that there is Actually, up to this point, I've been highly impressed with how well Canada has handled immigration. Yeah, and it's quite interesting that uh, they have handled it noticeably better than the US, which is itself a topic of the book, which somebody has written. And uh, uh, I am looking forward to getting a copy. But uh, the fact that even Canadians are capable in a much more polite way than Americans. But they're capable of a xenophobic reaction is not a total surprise. There's been a large immigration into Ontario, and I would think eventually this, though I know almost nothing about the details, I would think in general this might have a pro cause problems. Some questions are coming in. Uh, these both go sort of in the direction of Implementation, uh, how do we change the mindset of the 1% versus the 99%? How do we get where you want us to be? And how do we start to, uh, how do we start to restructure? You know, what does that look like? How will we get to your policy prescriptions? 
to a surprising degree, part of the 1% is quite sympathetic to this argument. I would say uh, what I'm saying would not astonish Bill Gates. I think he is not merely clever enough to become a billionaire. He also shows a certain wisdom. He devoted, having made billions, he, f he figured quite correctly that additional billions would not change his life, make him any happier, and I, can, I could give you data indicating, yes, that's true. There's a very steep curve of escaping starvation makes you way better off, but above a certain level, additional ga economic gains don't really increase your happiness. It's sort of one chapter of a wonderful book you should all get called Cultural Evolution, and uh, it's, uh, it's one chapter, what I've been talking about today is more the ninth and 10th chapters. But basically, I think uh, a significant part of the top 1% are sympathetic. I would say for sure. The Koch brothers in the US and uh, many of the billionaires in the US are monstrously unsympathetic to this. They will fight tooth and nail and they have hugely disproportionate power. And Trump is appointing a Supreme Court that is in their pocket, to put it bluntly. The US Supreme Court has recognized that billions should have, should have their freedom of speech. And if you've got billions, you should be free to spend any amount you want on influencing the political process. Civilized countries like Great Britain have limits to how much you can spend on a campaign because they have this naive belief that spending billions on television advertising might influence the result. Uh, I think uh, there is some evidence that it actually does. And so it's, it's an uphill struggle. I would say the card, the, the sort of the ultimate reason why I have not given up hope is in a democracy, we still have roughly one person, one vote. Uh, Wyoming is six times as, uh, a citizen of Wyoming is with six Californians, and they deserve every bit of it. But apart from that, we have mostly a democracy where the majority can win. And I think that it's a question of if the 99% become aware that their interests today are not identical with those of the 1%, that we need substantial government reallocation. 99% is a winning coalition. So in democracies, there's hope. Okay, excellent. Uh, the questions I have to say are just flooding in, so I'm gonna try and combine them. Uh, so I'll read out several and then please, please take with you will. Uh, someone else who likes the counter example. What about uh, Scandinavian countries where we have massive tax, ra tax rates, the developed welfare state and yet xenophobia? So much lo lower levels of inequality. Uh, can the types of change you propose be achieved by a single nation, given that the free, given the free movement of, of capital, i.e. capital flight of taxes are high in one, one country? Uh, this is very specific on questions of tax. Tax on robots, tax on internet uh, transactions, tax on something? Maybe I'd better stop here. All right, all right. Because look, look, we have to get through when here. I've but I've got three questions, I begin to forget. Yeah, all right. Uh, so when I meet uh, a room full of people, more than three kind of get beyond me. I, I can remember the first three, and then who knows? Basically, what was the first question? Uh, Scandinavia. <laughs> oh, goody, Scandinavia. Okay. Scandinavia is a very interesting case. It is exactly the most post-materialist part of the world. Sweden is the most secular post-materialist country in the world. And up to now, they've shown they've behaved accordingly. They have been highly tolerant, very supportive in terms of foreign aid, very open to immigration and so on. And I think precisely because of this, they have become a target for immigration. If I were a Syrian wanting to go somewhere, I would not go to, to Greece. Much more attractive to go to Sweden, where they have very good programs that welcome you and take care of you and integrate you and provide computers and cell phones. And uh, 
Furthermore, it was up to now a very hospitable country to immigration. So they have had this dramatic shift from 98% Swedish to now 18% foreign born, and the foreign born are very visible. They're mostly Islamic. And Swedes are aware of it, and some Swedes are scared by it. I would say Sweden is still a very decent country, but they have a substantial xenophobic party. Okay, the next question was? Uh, types of tax okay. and, and capital flight. So can, well, one state, yeah. can one state do it alone? Capital is very mobile, but tax policy can help do this. One of the things that the U.S. has had is corporations that are making huge amounts of money in the U.S. suddenly buy some little company in Ireland and become Irish. And uh, then they don't pay U.S. taxes. Changes in tax policy could solve this. If you pay taxes on the money you make in that country, it would cut back on the, it would make this unrewarding. Taxes on robots is one way to go. I'd say it's a sort of partial solution. It, would be, it strikes me as helpful. Uh, and I think basically we need something more comprehensive than simply taxes on robots. Okay, this was a question for me. Why is Monk giving a platform to Steve Bannon at the Monk debates? <laughs> so I'm going to take this question, not you. Okay. Firstly, uh, the Monk School is not the Monk debates. They are separate organizations, though they are our friends. Uh, and I can't speak for the Monk debates, but I think uh, it would be this. They, like the Monk School, fundamentally believe in freedom of speech, even speech on the part of those whom we might find loathsome and disgusting. And I, for one, look forward to Steve Bannon not being surrounded by his sycophants, but rather by a hostile Torontonian audience and a man who is, a man who is, whatever you think of his support for the Iraq war, one hell of a debater. So those of you who oppose Steve Bannon, I would strongly encourage you not to avoid the debate, but to attend it and to clap when the other person is speaking. <laughs> okay. Yeah, this, uh, this, just, this one digs a little bit deeper. Uh, what, what is the specific... Um, they didn't use the word mechanism, but it's implicit. What is the specific connection between xenophobia and the knowledge? So you have the knowledge economy, you have, econ uh, you have growing inequality, and then you have xenophobia. How do you actually link those, those two? Insecurity. There's a lot of research indicating that insecurity is conducive to the fear of foreigners and xenophobia, and that the insecure strata are the most xenophobic, and that a given place becomes more xenophobic in times of insecurity. A classic example is that of Germany in the Weimar era, when in 1928, the economy was doing pretty well, and the Nazi party was seen pretty much as a lunatic fringe party that got 3% of the vote. In the aftermath of the Great Depression, in 1932, people were starving to death. The middle class was desperate. The country was in very scared conditions. And the Nazis got 44% of the vote for the Reichstag and took over. They became by far the biggest party. This is one of the really scary historic examples, but by and large, insecurity is conducive to xenophobia and economic and psychological is insecurity. I don't see it as just the knowledge economy. I see this as particularly big because it's structural. I see it as inherent and growing. But massive immigration in a setting that is not accustomed to immigration also leads to insecurity for this basic reason. You feel you're not living in the country you were born into. You're a stranger in your own land. Right. Uh, this is a question about, uh, combining a couple of questions here. Uh, how do we handle, in the trajectory you recommend, 
the contempt for knowledge and expertise, a decline in respect for the norms and institutions. What do we do with Fox and fake news? I mean, those are all obstacles to, to overcoming this, and, and quite profound ones. It is really dismaying because, oh, to pick out of the air one example, Donald Trump, is a massive habitual liar. It is just day after day he says things that are demonstrably not true. He gets called on them by the politifacts and by some of the press and dismisses it as fake news. What's dismaying is he gets away with it, not in general. I think most of the people I know recognize he's an habitual liar, but a substantial share of the American public, I think, just overlooks the fact that he's a liar or even believes when he says the New York Times and all the mainstream media are fake news. Because of their emotional bias, he is alone defending them against hordes of Mexican rapists and criminals. And I think it's a grossly inaccurate, horrendously inaccurate depiction, but People who are scared, who are genuinely experiencing insecurity, are much more vulnerable to this kind of lie. So the ultimate, cause, the ultimate cure is alleviate insecurity, which we can. We're not doing it, but we can. And uh, continue to expose as lies the lies, I think, that in the long run, uh, this has an effect. I applaud the American media. Most of the media have stood up bravely in spite of blatant attempts to intimidate them and silence them and to say that they're fake news and they're standing up bravely doing exactly what the press should do. Trump is trying to destroy the free press. It is bravely continuing to criticize him in the face of severe threats. Um, a couple of, well, I'll collect them, I'll collect them for you anyway. Uh, education, I mean, is edu better education for the 99% uh, not simply part of the solution? And uh, what about assimilation versus um, multiculturalism? And I have to warn you that this audience is deeply attached to multiculturalism. So if you, there's two, there's two dangers. Make the French speak English. They can do it if they try. <laughs> Good. There we go. <laughs> do you? Do, but seriously, do you see? Do you, do you see any difference in the in the data uh, between countries? I think the answer is no, given the Front National in France but between countries that are more assimilationist towards immigrants, do you have lower levels of xenophobia than in countries that are, are less assimilationist, like Germany? Let's leave Canada out of this because it's a, it's a special okay, case. That's complicated. I would say after you've assimilated them, you have fewer problems. Assimilation against their will is coercive and anti-democratic. And one of the things that's quite interesting about Canada is Canada is an overachiever in terms of not having a populist party, though they seem to be, Quebec, uh, the Ontario seems to be moving toward that. But I would say, by and large, Canada looks like an example of a country with a lot of immigration that has handled it well, maybe because they gave up on trying to make the French speak English and have for quite a while accepted biculturalism. And I think that has sort of maybe inoculated them against, forced them to be just like us. Your, their hearts are, are bursting with patriotic pride, so I have to, I have, well, actually, I, uh, I have, I have to cut in and slightly disagree. Sure. We only, we only admit rich immigrants, and we have a wonderful wall between us and Mexico, which is called the United States of America. And for, more often. and I'm quoting Jeff Wrights, who's in the audience, and for which America paid. So th that is why immigration is popular in this country. Now, polling data. Uh, th I don't know if this is true or not, so I'm just going to ask you. Uh, to, what, uh, to what degree would you attribute it? Out, or, so how would you explain recent polls indicating that millennials 
are the most likely to be non-religious and progressive, but much more likely to identify as pro-life. Is that true? I've not read that, but Gee, you're the expert. Uh, it's new to me. It's new to you. Okay, yeah. It, it would, it's, it's surprising, but I don't know. Yeah, okay. We would need, we would need uh, confirmation on that. Uh, this, yeah, this is an interesting question. You mentioned the uh, dehumanization of the delegitimization of the elite as a major instrument in authoritarians' rise to power, but the authoritarians are frequently members of the elite themselves, or, in fact, they're not populist. They, I mean, they want to become the elite. You know, Orban mm -hmm. wants to stay in power forever. Um, how do you approach this double standard? And my, my question would be, why is that message not getting through, through to populist voters that the the, the Trump, Trump, Trump himself is not exactly a man of the people yeah that's right yeah he was son of a millionaire got his fortune 30 million dollars from papa he really worked his way up yeah yeah and uh, <laughs> okay i think to a degree that is interesting trump is an absolutely shameless liar he gets away with it because he believes whatever he says at a given time. In other words, I think he's not fully in touch with reality. What he believes, when he says these preposterous things, I think he actually believes them. And this makes him a very convincing liar. This guy is spontaneous, sincere. You can say he's saying what he really thinks. He is at the moment. And this, this is scary. I think only if you have an emotional desire to believe him, do you believe him? But a large share of the population of the U.S. is scared. And I really, I think this is underestimated, to what extent a large share of the population of the U.S. and of other countries has been going nowhere for 30 years. Their real income has declined. Their job security has declined. And this in a context where the economy is growing and expectations are rising, what was considered a decent standard of living 30 years ago is no longer the same. Aspirations are higher. Their relative position has declined a lot. These are scared people. And I think frightened people are prone to believe liars. I think this is part of the authoritarian reflex. You believe what your leader tells you, even when he's lying. And I think this is a frightening phenomenon, but I think, uh, I think it is consistent with this whole picture of insecurity breeds authoritarianism. Mm -hmm. And of course, it's underestimated to what extent this is real. This insecurity is not just an illusion. It's not just they see billionaires and they're poor. Uh, it is, the reality is a large share of the American public has given up, has dropped out of the workforce, is living on opiates to the point where they have declining life expectancy. And it's so severe that since 2012, the life expectancy of the US population as a whole has declined slightly. Mm. This is really scary because it's a law of nature. Obviously, life expectancy rises with modernization. You get better diet, better medical care, better public health, all kinds of medical advances. Obviously, life expectancy in the US almost doubled over the past 120 years. It's not increasing anymore. This is a serious problem. Uh, this is a question about, is there a way to accelerate the evolution of the change in consciousness that is needed for a population to vote for a party that will pursue the necessary changes? Yes, but it's very difficult. I think the key is making people more secure. This is partly a matter of government intervention, social policy. Can we make people more secure? Of course we can. The welfare state measures that were introduced in the 30s had a big impact. They actually made people more secure. Old people used to be desperately poor. We have Social Security now, which has not been abolished. And uh, older people are comparatively comfortable now. 
And the relative happiness levels of different age groups has changed accordingly. It is not just to say, well, it's a very big change. However, this is, requires major political change. Okay. And this will be our last uh, question. And this, this is kind of goes to the issue of getting out of the bubble. Uh, out of the bubble. What do you think of the potential benefit of inviting people to think and talk about what, what matters to them most? Uh, do we, as is so often said, you know, what's wrong with Kansas? Do we leave New York and move out and talk to people in rural areas? And will we reach them? And, or <coughs> this is my addition, it's not in the question, or will these people simply say to us, well, I hate queers and immigrants, and I've had exactly those conversations. Some of them hate queers and immigrants, sure, that's true. I think reaching out, as Kathy Kramer in her interesting book about Wisconsin did, it gave her an understanding, though she was from a comparatively secure part of Wisconsin, I think it gave her an insight into what these people are feeling. And instead of contempt for these blatant bigots, she began to see them as human beings who are feeling real pain. They are, not, they are human beings. They're worth talking to and listening to, and you're not gonna convert them overnight. But understanding that they're human beings and treating them accordingly is part of the solution. I think you don't convert to them, but I think talking with them, listening to their concerns, to some extent responding, I think is part of the solution. Great, thank you very much. Well, I'd like to now ask Michael uh, Adams, the founder of Environics and the Environics Research Institute, and, and a pollster who's really done so much to educate all of us about public attitudes in Canada. Michael, uh, please come and uh, close the evening. This is the book. Uh, Neil Nevitt asked me to be sure to present my PowerPoint. <laughs> it's only 45 minutes, Ron. So. Uh, well, you know, it's really terrific uh, that on a Friday night during a film festival that we could bring in a public intellectual and fill this auditorium. So it's a tribute to you, sir. Um, In Veronics Institute, I founded in 2006, we survey opinions, attitudes, and values. We um, survey special populations in Canada, like Muslims or black people in the GTA, urban Aboriginal people. Um, and we also try to figure out what are these surveys telling us about our culture. And when I was writing my last book, Could It Happen Here, um, there was a paper you co-authored with your colleague Pippa Norris. This was the, the thing that kind of inspired you then to write this book. And it was going around as I was writing my book and I thought, oh my God, thank God Ron Engelhardt has weighed in to what's going on with this cultural backlash, the backlash that's going on to the to the uh, modernization process that he had spent uh, years um, researching. He started surveying in 1970. I founded my company, Environics Research, in 1970, and he's been a hero of mine. He's been a hero of Neil Nevitt. We've written books. You wrote Decline of Deference. I wrote Sex in the Snow. You had some data. Mine was an autobiography, but <laughs> we... <laughs> You know, you know me, I'm kind of fixated with these cultures and uh, cultures being on trajectories. He's surveying in 150 countries. It's astounding what this man has been able to do, the Euro barometer, all these countries. Actually, I think it was last year I saw him delivering an address in, in, on the Arabian Peninsula. Um, and I saw, I saw him give this address. I'm doing my book, Could It Happen Here? I called up Randall. I said, two years ago, we brought uh, Robert Putnam here. You, some of you might have been here and talked, of course, about 
social capital, I said, we've got to get Ron Ingold up, Hart up here to put this, this xenophobia, this back, international backlash in context. I know the Canadians are anxious um, about this. Ron says he's coming out with a book. It's called Cultural Evolution. His best friend, Jeff Bezos, would be happy to send it to you. If you, <laughs> if you just Google him, he'll have it to your door probably in a week. Um, and, you know, sometimes they say the pollsters, you know, get things wrong. Well, one of the things we didn't get wrong, that we can't predict the future, was inviting this man to come here on the day that Maxine Bernier founds the People's Party. To, to, to. So, you know, God is looking down on us and saying, okay, you guys, maybe it can happen here. Max Bernier splits off from the Conservative Party and is explicitly, at least part of his program, is to question our sacred cow of multiculturalism. So we are going to find out, ladies and gentlemen, whether it can happen here. Now, I've always said it can happen here. I'm just thinking that cultures do have their institutions, and our institutions, I think, are going to be strong enough to withstand this. These, these twin forces of, of income inequality and of economic and status anxiety, which is what he, he's writing about and what he's telling us about, which is, is fueling this, this backlash that we're seeing in the modern world. So um, this is just such a treat to bring a hero to our city, to have him give you this big picture and to help us Canadians kind of put ourselves in the context of global trends and the world out there is reacting. We do have a populist premier in Ontario. We now have at the national level, we're going to have a political party that's going to question uh, this, this now one of the core values of our culture, which is a, a culture of integration, which we call uh, multiculturalism. This man has given us uh, food for thought, but we can't just have food for thought. We also have to have food. And it's now about 8 o'clock, so I'm sure some of you have delayed having dinner. And, um, and I would suggest with your dinner that some Canadian uh, Riesling and, uh, or maybe a Cabernet Sauvignon would help the discussion that I'm sure you're going to have with your friends and colleagues about what this man has told us. So, um, Randall, my partner, where are you? Uh, uh, at Monk, uh, thank you for partnering with us. It's been a delight. Uh, to deal with you on this, uh, on this project of bringing Ron Englehart uh, to our city. And uh, you've been a terrific audience. You gave him some tough questions. He did a pretty good job in answering them, even the Canadian content ones. And uh, so I want to thank you all for showing up. Uh, we're going to do this with Monk again, maybe in a year or two, uh, bringing somebody in from around the world who is going to help, try to help us put our country in context. So. Ron, thank you very much. It's, it's a true delight to have you here. And I think... Uh... <laughs>